How's it going, everybody? Really excited to welcome Jerry Burns to the Philosophy Podcast. Jerry's the head lacrosse coach at Harvard, and uh, really fired up to welcome you back to the show, man. Yeah, you can say again, you know, Jerry, if you start getting comments from your, your, your fans and subscribers and say, can you not have that guy anymore, just let me know. I, I got thick skin. <laughs> I think you're the only, only person who's been on more than twice, and I think this might be like our fifth podcast we've done. We just, we just, you know, we're two guys who like to talk. No doubt. <laughs> Last night, we, we should have recorded our conversation. I mean, that would have been an awesome podcast. Yeah, you know, some, some of the best, you know, as they say out in Hollywood, some of the best scenes end up on the cutting room floor. That's why I always, I always watch the director cut. I yeah. always watch the director's cut because, you know, another 30 minutes of a pretty good movie, it's, it's not going to hurt it that much, but there might be some gold in there. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're searching for is a, is a little gold. Last time we spoke, it was uh, sad times, man. We were just in the beginning of this pandemic. And... Um, it was, uh, it was crazy, and now we fast forward ourselves six months, and um, you know things are sort of a little bit under control, but uh, certainly not normal. Um, how are you doing, and where are you? Are you in South Bend, or are you in Boston? I'm in, uh, I'm in an undisclosed location in Cambridge. Actually, it's uh, Ted Bergman's uh, bachelor pad. Ted's one of my assistant coaches, coaches our goalie, and helps us on defense. He's done some Jamie podcast his, yep. his dojo is is pretty legit we might have to do a little tour later um it just it's it smells like single man you know a little a little uh you know track hard noir you know some underwear on the floor <laughs> scented candles it's pretty, pretty cool though He's a in, lot of uh, him. a lot of toy soldier discussions toy soldier goaltending of course there's a couple of toy soldiers on the on the uh, shelf over here and um you know, it, it's really cool. Those uh, Will Corrigan, Ted Bergman, and Neil Hutchinson all live about a mile and a half from each other in Cambridge. And Cambridge is a pretty big place, so it's pretty it's pretty funky. All the different squares that they have, and so I'm about six miles away. But uh, we're kind of rotating our apartments and and doing our meetings that way. Nice. Love it. You know, um, I've, I've crossed paths with a lot of the Harvard staff this summer. Will drove from California back to South Bend and then back to Boston and uh, made a stop at the Monroe residence. We had an awesome, I believe it was a three on three plus a goalie game um, with my daughter and uh, a few of her friends. And uh, it was phenomenal. Um, and so it was always great to see Will, his dog and his new fiance. All right. Did, 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 did Bailey, your dog, do you want any moving picks on anybody in, in that game? Bailey, Bailey looks out the window and uh, is very uh, interested, a little tentative because he's, he's turning 14 in about a couple weeks. So 14, that's like, do the quick math there. It's, it's what is that, 88 or something? That's uh, 98. I think. 98. And he's really old. So yeah. the last I, time you and I crossed paths, though. No, he didn't make 14 because I basically murdered him in South Bend when he mumboed me. So for people that don't know what Jerry's talking about, um, at the end of 10 weeks of quarantine, the Monroe family had, were kind of losing our minds, and we rented an RV, and we drove from Denver to Narragansett, Rhode Island, where we spent the, an incredible month of June. It was like an oasis from the pandemic. But along the way... I had the great idea that we would play a lacrosse game in every state. And so when we were in Illinois leaving uh, the truck stop where we slept that night, um, I, called, uh, I called Kevin Corrigan and I was like, hey, we're going to be coming through. We need a game. He's like, you got to stop in South Bend. And he's like, Jerry's around. I'll get him. So we ended up having a matchup, a three-by matchup. And the teams were me, Bernsey, and Emily versus Lucy, Casey, and Colin. And I went back and actually checked the film because we did film it. I checked the film and uh, Lucy scored the game winner. We, had, we, ended, up, we ended up losing. Um, but the play of the game actually did happen th 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 were from the dogs. So my dog Bailey was wandering around. I, I, when he, he wanders. He's old. It, he, he looks kind of like all the – you remember in the movie Halloween when, like, Michael Myers and all the crazy people are, like, wandering around the streets and when Michael Myers escaped – that's how he was kind of wandering through the game. And he inadvertently mumbled the crap out of Bernsey. And Bernsey fell 
like slow motion <laughs> backwards. Uh, he got tabletop basically, and it was it was unbelievable. Yeah, you and Emily are on. Okay. Hey, hey. What's it? What's your account now? What's your name? I got tackled by your ancient dog who snuck up behind me. And, you know, I've been coaching the moving picks from, you know, from your philosophy of, you know, the hybrid stuff that you've been teaching. And basically your dog has been taking it all in and, and found the perfect movement for the guy who's been like talking about moving picks and stick grabbing and interference from two man stuff. It was the ultimate revenge from your dog. <laughs> it was. I, honestly, it was scary because the dog, like, crumbled underneath you. I mean, the dog can hardly walk. His hips are, like, I mean, like, literally, he walks diagonal. He doesn't walk straight. He walks, like, literally, he likes, like, a sidewinder. That's, if you watch the film, and I'll send you the film, it's, it's pretty impressive. But, well, but the, most athletic, the most athletic player in, in the game was definitely Cliff. Cliff, Cliff, you know, made a... Steve McQueen, like, <laughs> escaped from my car, leapt out, leapt out, saw the action going on, had to lock him in my car, and he, he was tracking the whole game. And then he just said, I've had enough of this. So he, him and Charles Bronson, he dug a tunnel and got out of the car. And then next thing you know, he was chasing every ground ball. <laughs> and he was, he got every ground ball. He did. But luckily, he, you know, we were playing in the middle of the parking lot behind the Joyce Center. So it was actually kind of helpful to have him because when there would be a, you know, a missed pass or something, Cliff would go get it and we could just get started with the other ball. But actually, KC was saying that you were calling, that he would always give the ball to you. So, <laughs> so, so like Cliff would get the ground ball every single time and then give it back to our team. Cliff, Cliff, Cliff has been trained really well in my, in my backyard and my, my front yard. So um, you know, that guy knows where his treats are coming from. Man, when we had to get back into that RV and keep driving through Indiana, it was, uh, it was sad. That was definitely, uh, that was the highlight of the trip. You know, playing a lacrosse game in, in every, in, that, in every state was actually kind of a, kind of a highlight, you know, like the, <laughs> we stopped at the uh, Vince Lombardi rest area on the New Jersey turnpike. Cause we were at this point just in a hurry to get there and we just didn't feel like making anything special out of it. I think I think it's I think the, the quote of that is funnel cakes aren't everything, they're the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was just such a freaky time because like the world was just still like totally locked down and just the paranoia of getting out of the RV. But just you just had to get out of the RV. It was shaky, it was loud. The dog freak part of the problem was the dog was freaking out the entire time. He he wouldn't he wouldn't sit down. He stood up for the first 10 hours of the trip. And the guy is like, at the time, was the equivalent of like 92. Um, <laughs> but uh, a highlight of summer, though, was PLL. So obviously, you had to have been uh, rooting for your Redwoods. Uh, yeah. give, me, give me your opinion on what you saw, what you learned, what you were thinking about. Your tweets, by the way, I just want you to know, I copied, I screen copied every single one of your tweets, and I've added them to my coach's training program. So, I mean, you know, I don't mess around. There was some good information there and I got little explanations on what I, you know, what I thought. I'll, 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 be, I'll be waiting for my uh, lacrosse Your philosophy, uh, um, you know, beer koozie for, uh, you know, as far as payment. Um, no, it was, it was cool. It was, um, you know, I think it was, you know, an, the, the convergence of, you know, you know, again, we all watched the MLL and, and, and did that, but there was so much, so much buildup for the PLL, you know, and, you know, we had just started watching the high school stuff 
as well, because that had just started a couple of weeks earlier. But, you know, at that level, you know, you hadn't been with your team since, you know, the early to mid March. So it was like everybody was jonesing hard totally. to watch these games and they had been promoting it and they did a really good job of that. And so, you know, I think for lacrosse people, it was like, it was like appointment viewing. It was like friends in the early nineties, you know, people were just, you know, or Sopranos or Game of Thrones or yeah, depends on how old you are, the wire. And so, you know, everybody was, you know, watching, you know, and we were, we were on vacation on the Cape and our whole crew, we had a house rented with family and friends with like 12 people. And, we were all like huddled around this small TV and the rental house we had. So it was cool. I really enjoyed it. All right. So tell me some things that you kind of took from it. Some things that you noticed that you were interested in or that you thought were, were cool or really, you know, whatever was kind of catching your eye. Um, I, I, it was, I think more, more interesting was the difference between the stuff that was happening last year was not happening as much or at all this year. Like, I mean, I think there were a lot of two pointers from defensemen in the first year yeah. and probably less. So, you know, I think that's obviously better coaching and they had all this, you know, everybody had all this time from March, regardless of what you were doing in your profession, you were, you were preparing for July. So all the coaches obviously watched film and did assessment of their opponents. And so, you know, a kid like Newman, for example, I'm not sure he took a shot. And I think he had like five or six two-pointers last year. Yeah. Something like that. And so so all those teams that had defensemen who were shooting, I thought that that, that was kind of curtailed significantly. And I but I also think that part of that was also driven by the fact that like the subbing was much more improved. So <laughs> You had, whether you liked it or not, you had offensive minis who were going down to play defense. And so you didn't have as many fast breaks and unsettled that you had last year. So either as a function of better coaching or having the, you know, the, the film from last year and how you gave up goals, I think the substitutions were better. It wasn't just guys turning and running to the box. I think they rode a little bit um, more. So I think it, it created more of a, much more of a six-on-six -six game. You know, there was still some unsettled, but I don't think yeah. as much as, as as last year. I think, you know, you saw you saw I think much more selective, you know, big little and inverts and and matchup stuff. The the shot clock felt like it was going faster. It did. And and and, and you know, I think part of that was because teams were cutting out the fast breaks. Defense, and I commented on this multiple times. Yeah. Defensemen were clearing the ball more. Yes, offensive middies were trapped down there with D middies. Most D middies aren't offensive threats. There are a couple of guys who are. So if they stayed too long or the defenseman carried too much, but you, you had like a 30 second functional possession, and that's really hard to score. And I think you know, the def some of the defenses were really good, were built for six on six defense. And so I think situationally, there was stuff like that that really um, caught my eye. Um, the number of bounce shots. You know, uh, I think was way up, particularly from 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 the two pointers. Um, you know, I thought the goalie play wasn't. At, and again, I think this is a function of intelligence and better coaching. Is that I wouldn't say the goalie play wasn't as good. I think the the shooters were better, and they didn't take as many bad shots. I think last year was much more about entertainment value and that. And I think this summer, not that it wasn't about winning, but I think this summer was particularly about hey, we got a couple of weeks together. We got to be strategic. We got to be tactical. Let's not take bad shots. Yeah. So those were some of the things that popped to mind. You copied all my tweets, so maybe you'd have to remind me of some of those. <laughs> I know. I was just thinking I, I, I could dig those up. Um, but I do remember you talking a lot about about shot clock and 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 being getting off. You know, defense personnel getting off more quickly. Um, do you do you see that as an impact in Division One lacrosse? The same way. You know, I think. You know, I think you always have to make, you know, your, your philosophical decision on how you're going to play based on the talent that you have. Like, you know, and for us as a building program, we want to instill this concept of riding 
which right and it might be riding to substitute but but if you don't have that mentality then guys are just going to turn and run to the box and you'll yeah you'll ride one down and go you know three deep with your attack or one down and two deep and you're just trying to buy time so i think you have to start with your this kind of convergence of your mentality and your talent depth and then figure out what you're going to do from there i think um you know, I think you saw more two-way stuff, either out of necessity or situation or, hey, my guy's staying, so I guess I have to stay. So, yeah, I think maybe some players learn that they have that capability to do that and they can play defense for 30 seconds, which is not that long, um, or that they can do it situationally and, and those situations may benefit the offense or the defense. You'll figure it out. So I think – yeah, I think I think there was an epiphany for some players. Yeah, I did see um, Schreiber, Holman, and Manny stuck on defense for a shift, and they got the stop. They got the stop. You know, it, it, you know that's one of those situations where all the guys are head. Like you talk about your head being on a swivel. Yeah, and it's never a good sign when your guy on ball is looking for his slide guy already. <laughs> the on ball guy, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking around like, hey, I don't hear anybody. Here we they're go. Like, hey, like, hey, are you guys back there? Are you guys ready to help? It's and me. So, yeah, that, that's always a good sign. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, but I think, yeah, you either you either learned you could do it and you want to add that to your game or you, you learned how to survive it. But, you know, I think the two-way mentality – is, is both a skill and a strategy, but it's also a mindset. You have, to, you have to recruit that mindset and you have to hammer that mindset even before guys get there. You have to tell them to stay on the field on their club team when their club coach is telling them not to. They've <laughs> got to go to their high school coach and say, coach, I want to take wings. I want to play man down. I want to stay and play, you know, because my college coach, Coach Burns, telling them that, you know, I got to learn how to do this. We're talking about your, your relation last night who's, who's coming to Harvard and, you know, I want to see that guy play uh, some midi and defensive midfield. And so you, because changing that mindset is really hard. Like when we started at Harvard this fall, we were doing rides and riding and clearing stuff. Like we were literally like crossing guards at the box saying like, you know, we were doing a drill with some, you know, dummy offense into a set of clear and guys, we were like, Stop. I felt like Kevin Bacon in Animal House, you know. All is well. Don't <laughs> panic. All will be well. And then he gets run over by the, by the people. Yeah. That's what it was like. Like, we were telling guys to turn around, get back, get back on the field. And they're, like, running, uh, off, running off the field. Yeah, like, the box ain't moving, man. Turn your ass around. Get back out there and play defense. So, yeah. Hey, Hopefully they won't get me fired. Did you notice um, – did you feel like it seemed incredibly packed in defensively in the PLL and particularly early? And I think it opened up a little bit, but I wanted to get your opinion as to why you think that was. Um, what was um, your take you know, on that? Or did you not? You know, I think, I think you know, defensively, if your offensive shape starts like that, it's really easy. You're starting from a condensed position. So that just, you know, that, that serves the defense. So I think a lot of it is, is, is spacing and initial dodge, initial spacing, initial shape clarity from the offense. Like, all right, what are we in? Where are we starting? And what do we want to try to happen? Because if you can make a team slide and recover twice when you only have a 30-second functional possession after, you know, the defenseman clears the ball and stays too long or the D-Mitty comes down and he holds the ball. Like, if you only have 30 seconds and you make them and you can slide and recover twice, you're probably going to get a shot clock violation, which there was probably more shot clock violations yeah. in this iteration than there were last year. Partly it was guys weren't taking bad shots, but part of it was the better substitution riding and the overcarrying from the defenseman and the D-Mitties. But I think a lot of the packing in from the defenseman wasn't a strategy from the defense. It was more of a function of, and again, you you preach this, is if you're, if you're doing two-man – or pair stuff, or did what we call devil, because of what Duke played, or what we mean in my, in my old job, is um, you're just feeding the defense. You're, you're, you're doing a lot of these 45-degree angle 
meaning south north or east west where you're coming off a two man and your move is not parallel to GLE it's running toward you know the corner of the field toward the midline again you know yeah they screw it up and you get some hesitations but you're gonna have to regather yourself and reattack now from a great angle so I don't think the two man when it was bad it was really bad but when it was good it was really good and I think a lot had to do with the initial shape the initial starter dodge and the angle of that I kind of felt like uh, it had a lot to do with the fact that the ball just wasn't moving. And so, like, you know, if, if the ball stays on one side, the backside is going to be in anyways. And then if the ball really doesn't move or it stays on that side, even with a pass, ball movement will spread a defense out. And same with the okay. two-man game. You know, if you look at when the two-man games look great, like for the chaos, when they looked good, they were, they were swinging the ball and it looked like box across. I mean, you know, the stats are out there in box where if you, you know, the Georgia Swarm, Jordan McIntosh did a talk. I don't know if you were there a couple of years ago at the convention um, at that pro night in which he was like, hey, when we swing the ball three times, you know, our, our, st our statistics of scoring, our percentages are much, much higher. And I think that's really kind of what it's all about is like the ball movement itself has to happen. Otherwise, the defense has an ability to just pack it in, you know, and they will naturally. Well, you, you know this is like, if you think two-man is about you too much, yeah. then the ball doesn't swing. If you think right. on the first time you run it that they're going to screw up the pick or screw up the hedge or go for the elbow pump fake or, you know, if you refuse to pick and try to come underneath. If you think it's going to work the first time, which is what Jordan is talking about, then yeah. – there's a, there, you know, there's a confidence there, maybe a selfishness, but it, and, but if you defend that well, you're going to steal like three to five seconds from that. Position. Totally. Exactly. You're guard, not only are you guarding the guy, but you're all over his hands and he can't get rid of the ball. And now he's got to carry another couple of steps. And then the swing is really more survival than a swing versus, right. and again, I don't know this stuff as well as you, but I went down and spent a couple of days with the swarm thing is that, you're going to know within a step or two where the benefit is. Yeah. Is there a benefit? And if you right. keep on dodging and re-dodging, that's, you know, and exactly. I think that's what you saw when it was bad. But, you know, for the chaos, they also had, you know, four to five, you know, Native Americans and, and Canadians on the field. And, yeah, they're going to be good at it. You know, you know yeah, when, no when, you it, when you see it not run well, it's usually not because they have four Canadians out there doing it. When uh, I remember five years ago, um, my son Colin played intermediate lacrosse and the coach there is this guy, Pete Tellis, really smart guy. And he like literally wouldn't let the guys feed a pick and roll. He, if you did, you, you might get hooked or you'd get yelled at, even though there were a successful pick and roll sometimes. But it was like, I don't want you feeding a pick and roll. I want you swinging it. And it was, it was in the spirit of the defense is going to – rotate towards where that pick and roll is going and if you don't feed that and you swing it now when the ball swings they, <clears> that the roll man is still open and that's your nation's look and you can still feed that guy and meanwhile you've created difficult approaches on the other side from from the slough in and i i think in the end the concept is you know you don't have to necessarily have that rule although that makes sense but i think the concept is don't play out your pick and roll to the bitter end because if you do, you're just killing time on that shot clock. And if you swing right. it, you're, you're going to know pretty early, like you said. There's going to be a pretty good indication you've got something. Yeah. Um, but when you kind of feel like, I don't, you're giving go when your nation's looks are there. And then you can feed. It's like feeding the feeder. No, like, and, and, and you're getting the, you know, you're getting a change of the side of the field. I, I, I think a hash-to-hash -hash pass side to side is, I, you know, Oftentimes, I refer to that as a skip pass, even though it's not like your traditional right. it's like a, yeah, yeah. Because you're, you're changing sides of the field. The ball's traveling a long distance. It's forcing you to shift your attention and your, your chin and your, your torso and your feet in all these ways. And so, you know, I think it comes back to, you know, two, two points I want to make. You know, when, when I was coaching against Brownie at Denver, like, you know, I called it deception because I, I liked that it – you know, they would they would dummy a two man or a three or, or a three on three in the corner of the field. Yeah. And then then because they had such great sticks, they'd fire a twenty five yard pass, and now they have this temporary three on three and four on four. 
which which I think is just brilliant. Yeah. You know, and we would have these these massive you know chess matches between you know he and I, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. But we'd be screaming deception, so that our guys would steal a few sex and you know don't get don't get distracted by this shiny object over here, which is this <laughs> dummy two man. We'd be screaming deception and and try to shift our attention and our you know our, the the composition of our off ball shape to the to the the side of the field where the ball hasn't even gotten to yet. So we'd be practicing screaming deception. But I remember in 2008, we played, when I was coaching at Notre Dame, we played uh, the, the Canadian national training team at yeah. Portland Park High School in Buffalo. And that was the first time I'd seen nations, like the pick, you know, the pick, the transfer to the other side and hit the roll man on the cut to the middle. And like, I remember being at halftime in that game, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and that thing, my guy is so bad. I'm like, I can see that coming. What the hell are you guys doing? You know? So, but but that's the brilliance of it's not about you in that moment. It's about right. shifting the sides of the field, swinging it, and then taking advantage of what that side to side skip pass, that new imbalance, what that creates for the offense and the challenge for the defense. Right. And what people don't realize, too, the nation's look is when, when there's a switch and the picker caught to the net. But when there's no switch, the give and go is just as open as the nation's because the defender on ball that's not switching is still getting chipped. And so you're, you're way better off getting it back than trying to dodge all the way in there. Yeah. No, I, I love that. You know, you saw it. There were a couple of – I think Jordan McIntosh yeah. scored on something like that in that yep. game. He gave up the ball. His defenseman relaxed, and he just – sprinted past him so but it does make me remember that that brownie did did score a nation's goal uh in a, in a at, at uh in uh at Denver, high stadium. Stadium. stadium yeah yeah i was I, I was on that game it was a timeout right before the half yeah right yeah exactly I, yeah talk and about I mean, getting I mf you probably got mf on that one i got mf i was mfing myself i was mfing myself because in 2008 he had done that to me because he was coaching on the canadian team and Trust me, for the for the next 10, 11 years that I coached at Notre Dame, we practiced that every game. I don't think it ever happened again. I'm knocking, I'm knocking wood. Hopefully, you want to play Denver in the future. Um, let's talk about. I think my favorite player in the TLL, Eddie Glazner. I mean. It's unbelievable watching that guy play. There's nothing better than like watching him get mic'd up. And I don't want to rip on anybody else, but when other guys are mic'd up, there's like three words spoken sometimes. And with Eddie, it's like literally, it's just like this nonstop conversation, uh, maybe uh, maybe a little bit more urgency than in, in, in the descriptor, but um, but it's unbelievable. It's you know it's it's it's, it's awesome. Eddie's. And he's, you know, and he's special, you know, because, you know, as you know from coaching for a long time, very few guys, everyone's always asking you, coach, what do I need to do? What can I do? I, you know, I'd like to help the team. Sometimes I want to, you know, they ask if they can play more, you know, whatever that conversation is. You've had hundreds of them. I've had hundreds of them. Yeah. And, and, and you have that conversation, you give the three to five things that they, that you give them. And, and some guys do them. Some guys don't. Some guys don't do it enough. Sometimes don't guys don't do it well enough. But you know, I gave them those three to five kids. I, I I said this on another podcast that you know I was he called me. I was on the I was on uh, uh, whatever the bridge in San Francisco is. What's the bridge in San Francisco? Golden Gate. Golden Gate Bridge. Holy, my, I'm getting old. I can remember movie lines, but not the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm on the Golden Gate Bridge. I was with some college buddies, and he called, and I gave it to him. I gave him the things, and he did it. And I told him, you know, one of the things I told him was I wanted him to be a PhD in our language and our PhD in the defense because you're, you know, you're a good cover guy, but your greatness is going to be as a guy who can tell other people what to do and, and have a command of, of what really good off ball defense is. And he did it, man. And, and now he's, I, and I've said this on other podcasts is that, you know, that's what you should aspire to be if you want to be a great defenseman because not everybody's gifted with, you know, elite feet or whatever, you know, good genetics, bone structure. Like, and he's got, you know, and he's a good looking guy. He's put together, but he's like, he had to work for those things. And, and yep. he made that happen. So if you're a defenseman, 
the 99.9 percent of defensemen out there that's a guy you should study totally. he's got a command of the language he knows what's going to happen before it's going to happen or the potential scenarios of what's going to happen he knows where his guy is he knows where your guy is he's telling you the things to to look out for and you know and, and that's how i coach because i know that everyone's going to have 99.9 percent of the the body types and the athleticism on defense like you need guys like him yeah and and he's he's embraced it he's immersed himself in it and again i think he if i was the national team coach tomorrow he'd be the first defenseman i would take yeah i, I think i i would do the same his ability to process in real time is amazing and if you watch anybody who's out there and this is going to be a, a, a bad memory in some ways, Jerry, but it was an amazing game. It was the, 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 the semifinal game, which really you could have called it the national championship in 2015, Denver, Notre Dame. And watching the Denver offense that were so loaded and doing so many things and watching you guys just, you know, step for step, punch for punch. The, if you watch how many decisions these defensemen had to make, in that game and the processing that was going on with all the stuff you're talking about, two men over here, a swing over here, Zach Miller redodging on this side, kicking an inside hand to ball to X to, to Ken Azaro, who's kind of hanging up Landis. And like the whole thing was just unbelievable. And yeah. I think the reason why I bring it up is because it's not just your ability, you know, being loud is obviously really important, but, but you have to be able to process it. And I want to talk about like how, how do you do that? How do you teach that? How do, how do kids learn that? Because it's like thinking on your feet. You got to be able to think on your feet and be able to react quickly. It, it's, it's probably a lot alike how when you start building up two man stuff from the, you know, like, like one side two man, like, all right, here's a, yep. here's a pair on, on one hash. And you're, you probably take, you know, guys and gals through, here's the initial debt, you know, here's your initial dodge you know here's where you're reading where your defenseman is and maybe he's looking where you think the pick angle is coming from where the hedging defenseman where is he like you got to teach guys all that stuff and gals all that stuff right yeah because you want to become good at all right am i slow dodging this and hesitating am i coming off of it hard am i coming underneath am i step away and an elbow faking i mean like you're, you're teaching i do the exact same stuff but you know, for me, when I'm when I'm teaching it, I'm not only teaching the two guys who are on the side with the ball. I'll 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 work in one, two, three guys in the beginning on the other side of the ha on the other hash, who are watching the reads that the off ball guy is the off ball defender is doing, and that's going to create how you play that or screw it up or how well the dodge is. All those different scenarios creates pressure on guys who might not even be in the frame of the film and yeah. so we'll, we'll for example we'll we'll practice the pick and roll and apple was particularly gifted at this if he was like so so duke ran what we call devil their pairs and ronnie was really good at much like brownie kind of every year adding a new different wrinkle to screw with the defense is that um you know denver uh, duke would throw back a lot on that and if Apple was responsible for the guy at GLE or below X, the way we taught it that was that he would spike up the hash yep. and take and, and get ball pressure on that guy quickly. So an adjacent slide by, by a coach who teaches crease slides. So that was a wrinkle that we developed to counter some of the wrinkles that they were doing. So we, will, we would practice all the different scenarios of all the things that could happen. So that's how you teach it. Eddie was really gifted at it. Apple was good at it. Sexton was good at it. Um, you know, uh, Lando was, was great. All those guys were really good at it. But you become good at it because, like Eddie, you're watching A happen and already thinking about B, C, and D yeah. while, while still keeping an eye on your man and filling space and doing all that stuff. You, so you practice the iterations just like you would do. You know how like you're in a conversation and then like an hour you're thinking about it an hour later and you're like, damn, I, I should I could have said this and it would have been really, really a good comeback or whatever. You know, that's that's what practice is all about. Because you you know, when you're in the games and you're like an hour later, man, I should have made that spike, you know, that's that's why you have to just rep 
that stuff. And having watched you guys practice over the years, not so much at Harvard, probably more at Notre Dame, but I'm sure it's similar philosophy. Um, the scenarios that you're putting your players in are real and you're, and I want to make a comment about how much you, you really are coaching your defensive guys on the offensive side, almost as much as on the defensive side. We talk about why that's so important. You know, you, it's, it's, a, it's, I, I think it's benefit, you know, like, listen, we all only have so much time to coach only so much time for film, almost so much time on the, the field with them. So yeah, I think you gotta be, you gotta find ways to, to maximize reps. And I think that, you know, having defensemen go against defensemen within these scenarios, like complex scenarios, you start simple and then yeah. you build up, you know, complex in the sense of, Hey, you play on Saturday and you got, you, know, you play Duke on Saturday and you got Denver on the next Saturday. That's, you know, that's complex. And so, you know, you're trying to do reps. You're trying to, you're trying to get as much out of two minutes as possible. So if we were doing, you know, like Duke likes to dodge right on the middle of the field, they would do some of their pair stuff at the end, they would get Deemer or Miles or any of their, you know, uh, Smith, like they would dodge right in front of the goal at like 16 or 17 yards, trying to bait you to come adjacent and have their attack creep up to the GLE and get all six of their guys in really dangerous spots. So we'd have to, we practice that dodge, covering that dodge. We practice the language adjacently and in, crease, but then we would, you know, but we would do it with, you know, Glaze being covered by Landis and Landis covering yeah. Glaze. So they would know what that would feel like because I also wanted the benefit is I want the defensemen because they're playing the role of Deemer or Miles. I want them to see what they see, even though they're not as good at them as offense, they'll have an appreciation of the pressure on the slide guy, on the GLE defenseman, on the adjacent defenseman. Cause if you have that empathy, that'll, that gives you an extra benefit so that when you flip roles and you go from being, you know, Deemer dodging on the, on the Z line, right in the middle, right on, you know, 18 yards and right in front of the goal. And now you got to go be a GLE defenseman or the slide increased defenseman or an adjacent help guy. You know exactly what Deemer is thinking about in his feed and his shot. And that's a huge benefit to me. And, but you, I do it incrementally in pieces and build out from the pieces so that when you bring it, like, you know, I'm like, you know, people, you know, part hole, I'm like, I'm like crumb of the piece of the part of the hole. I, I, I like teaching because I think that helps guys understand. Yeah, really cool. Um, let's um, – oh, crap. Let me think. I had, I had something that, that I, I want to talk about Landis in a second, but there's one other thing, so we'll edit this part out. Um, um, shoot, what was on my mind? There was something – oh, yeah. So one thing we saw a ton – in, in, on uh, PLL Island was uh, a lot of reverse V holds. And so, let, 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 what do you call that? A Revo hold? Yeah. And, and, you're, and yeah. your boy Joe Keegan giving you shout outs. I'm like, people are like, that's your thing. I'm like, oh, what can you do? No, no. I, I always, I am always a, a footnoter, you know. So, I, I footnote you. I, I, I called it in my blog. I talked about it. I footnoted you. I think he didn't footnote my footnote. That's, you know, that like a, a Chaminade back in the day, that, that would be an automatic F. Like these young kids don't understand. Remember when you had to write papers? Yeah. And the hardest thing about the paper was the footnoting. At the like, end. Com comma, you know, the bibliography was one thing. The, the footnoting on the page where you had a comma and a semicolon and a, like, you could get an F quickly on that. So you could. Um, and it was like it was three o'clock in the morning and you're done with the paper. And now you gotta spend all this time on the freaking footnotes and the bibliography. You're like you're you had your elements of style, you had your strunk and white out, you know, you're like rifling through that. Um no, like the reverse V hold, I think and like it was one of those like happy, like a lot of stuff, you know. It's not you know this, like you just stumble onto some stuff just out of pure luck or just like recruiting, some of your best guys are yeah. some lucky happenstance, right? And so um, the reverse V-hold, Steve O'Hara, who was, you know, just one of my all-time favorite guys, was a first teamer and, you know, like a lot of guys that I like, linebacker and, you know, great pursuit guy, good athlete, super high IQ, kind of Eddie, like kind of Glaze before, like I think Glaze learns a lot from Eddie and I've never said that 
but you know glaze you know modeled himself i think a little bit after steve and and steve would do that steve it was strong he was a middle linebacker at saint joe and and he was he was put together man and he he would get guys in the in the revo and and i remember being like like seeing that and be like man i gotta teach some some guys don't do it very well it, it has to be a certain kind of athlete like landis never had to do it you know those guys it's usually a pretty good athlete who moves really well and can anticipate quicker guys moves and gets to really good spots steve would do it at guys at like two and two like right before the eye right before you know posting up and um and he was he was he was really good at it and that was that was kind of the genesis yeah, and, but then, but then I thought it became really a good thing to teach D middies. Totally, Jack Neer, Jack Neer became really good at it. Drew Shots became good at it. Carlson Milliken, who was a complete savage, who transferred from Virginia and played played for me at Notre Dame, was ridiculous at it. He would get guy in a V hole and throw them to yeah. other places. It and stops so, the lefty in their tracks, is what it does. It's like it just stops them. They're like, what? And and then you practice. You know, like guys would try to do it when they had no ball pressure, which doesn't work. You fall down a lot and the guy rolls and you fall down or you get called for a hold. You had to do it from um, – like he did it on – the Milliken did it on, on Donahue from Denver in one game. Like like it was definitely a hold, and I think I can still hear Bill calling for it. But, like, he murdered that kid. And so – but um, but I think it became more of a thing for D-Middies for me. But you had to do it from – and you're starting to see guys do it right near GLE against inverts yeah. and stuff. And so, yeah, it's become – but you have to do it from ball pressure because if you wind up from too far away, a yeah. really good player is going to roll and split and you're yeah. going to look foolish. But I, I'm a big fan of it. But but not everybody can do it. We had a kid at Harvard, Chris Rota, who was a D-80 for us, who um, was really good at it. And and ironically, I got Milliken, Shantz, and um, – Jack Neer on a on a uh, Zoom call with with my D middies at Harvard, and I think they might have talked to him about it. He became really good at it. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's it's really interesting, and and you're right. It's it's a lot. It's easier for a for a shorty, and and I think it's really important for a shorty to be able to do because it, it it actually gives you that left on right or right on left opportunity to, to apply ball pressure. Right. Um, in a way that guys aren't really used to, and it's a very strong position now with poles. It works really. I mean, there's a lot of guys that were doing it. Um, um, you know, Rowlett did it really well um, yeah. over the course of the tournament. And what, what, BJ, what BJ Grill, who was he was kind of funny because he I, I sent him a text in the middle of the tournament and, and welcomed him to the V hole club because I saw him going left on left against somebody. It, it, it might have been against uh, Gutterding or something like that, and he's going V hole. And then, but, but but I'm like, why don't you love the V hole? Because he's all over his reverse field. Yeah, well, you know, what you were seeing a lot was the guys who were doing the reverse V-hold is that they were also reaching for takeaways. And, and it, like, if you do it well, and, and you can also kind of reach across the guy's chest and, and kind of rake the ball to the ground. So you yeah. saw some takeaways in there. Like um, a reverse ding-dong? <laughs> a dong-ding. <laughs> a dong diggly. Um, you know, I think that um, – you know, like guys starting to be old is a cool, like, you know, you and me, we're holding it down. I know. There's a few other people out there that are uh, V-holding. A lot of guys were, honestly. The V-hold, well, um, you know, well, what you people don't realize, you said trust. this. Jamie, you have to have the trust that you're, whether it's a cross cage help or a crease help. Like, you, that I, I talk a lot about, we've talked about this. I, what I say is kind of dual directional trust. Like, I – if I'm taught to do A or B or whatever it is, I'm really sometimes only going to do it if I think C, D, and E are going to happen. So you have to practice that. Yep, like everything yeah. else, you have to practice that trust. Yeah. You have to practice the slides on a roll and, 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 and things like that. So the dual directional trust becomes you're not going to get guys to do the things that you want them to do on ball because their ego is always going to be in their head about, well, if I do this, and my guy doesn't support me, I'm going to look foolish and give up a goal. So you have to – the only way you take out that ego is teach your other guys to do the right things. You got to, you got to practice both sides of that coin. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. 
One thing uh, that was interesting watching the Apple Rambo V hold matchup. And Rambo is just such a beast. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, MVP last year, and, and it, you could argue he was the best player in the tournament, also. But but you you do see the value in the of the left on left matchup of Apple. And I think the guy Finn Sullivan, um, yeah, he, he switched over. Uh, Eddie was telling me that that they convinced him to to start using his V hold and. <laughs> He was, you know, he kind of grew up as a cross check hole guy, but but he made, you know, he well he got welcome to the club. And but but what was really interesting when you watch, and I've watched these clips a bunch of times of that matchup, um, particularly with Apple, and it was like his hips were slightly below the hips of Rambo, so he didn't have an easy underneath spin move while the ball pressure was coming from his V hold. His feet were continuing to move. He wasn't relying on his stick to stop him. His feet were continuing to move, but but lefties are not used to being guarded by lefties, particularly with V holds, and so it kind of allowed the Red, Redwoods defense to 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 slide even and, and help and show right to Rambo's face, but it was hard for him to feed because of the ball pressure. And I just wanted to get your opinion on that because I I think a lot of people are afraid of V holds because they feel like well, I mean, if I if I turn them, there's not it, it's going to happen too quickly. And I think if you do it the right way you can, like you say, capture the guy. Well, you know, that, that comes back to that trust. Guys, if guys are worried about a question mark or an inside role, you know, like, first of all, Eddie definitely was not probably subtle. He's like, you're V-holding that guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be on our team, you're going to V-hold. Yeah, Did you yeah, hear his podcast with me? He knows, yeah, he knows, he knows the... Uh, if you don't V-hold, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> the... the uh, you know, it's the Henry Ford school. You can do it any way you want as long as it's this way. So, um, yeah, so, yeah. No, I thought that kid played – I thought Finn played really well, too. Um, I think that, you know, uh, um, Apple and, and Rambo uh, – um, um, Garrett covered him a couple of times in college, I think, and did, did yeah. really well. I mean, we – you know, those games were like five to three and five to four or six to five. So, I don't think anybody yeah. – you know – I think their defense is unbelievable too. That was the really cool oh, part. Okay. I, I always said that to Kevin Conry and Tills, like, you know, like people would be like pissing and moaning about those games. I was five to three or six five. Like we had a like four year run where I don't think nobody scored before, over seven goals. And so like, and people would complain and be like, you know what? You're just looking at the wrong things, man. You're looking at the wrong things. It's beautiful defense at both ends of the field. Great goaltending. Yeah, I mean, think about think about the defensemen in those games over like a four or five year period. Oh, they're like phenomenal. Bernhardt, Muller, uh, Dunn, you know the the D middies, you know Bernhard, you know Landis, Glaze, Apple, Sexton, Shantz, no, like sick games with Bernmore and Shane Dawson, like great goal. No, but I, I digress. Is that um, I think you know. The, the key part when you're V-holding a guy is not crossing over your feet. I call that getting scissored. Yeah. Like when you're – so for a lefty on a lefty, that would be Apple's – if his left foot gets higher than his right foot. So then if, if, if Rambo question marks or inside rolls, you're in big trouble, even if you have a slide. So the key, what you're talking about is, is finding your feet relative to Rambo – in a way that if he tries to step through, you still have ball pressure. And if he rolls or question marks, you can drop step. And so, you know, um, Apple happened to do that really well. And like, you know, Garrett, you know, when Garrett does simple things, he's as good as anybody. It's when he got out of character with, you know, he's a good hitter. Like he had some late hits and stuff like that, but he's a physical guy. But when he started trying to be a takeaway guy, it's just not, you, you know, it's not in your character. And so, um, but I think that's what he did and what he does is that when he doesn't cross over, you're not vulnerable to the inside role of the question mark. When you, when you can trail a little bit and, and send a guy off at an angle, the yeah. tangent relative to the crease, then that, be, that guy becomes a feeder or in a less dangerous part of the field. So right. that, that's what you want to look for, Jamie, for you as you're coaching and anybody who's listening is that, Watch that leg swing. The scissors. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, you know, you know who I was really impressed with uh, 
On the other side of the ball, former Notre Dame guy was Ryder Garnsey. I thought that guy stepped up in a situation where, you know, they didn't have Jules. And Jules is like a massive threat, you know, arguably as good as anybody in the league as a playmaker. He can do it all, really. He's an on-ball playmaker. He's an off-the-ball playmaker. He's a feeder. He's a scorer. He's very two-handed. And all of a sudden, Ryder, you know, had to really carry the load. And, you know, Cav was too, but, 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 um, but I thought Ryder ended up like really doing an unbelievable job. He was scoring one-on-one -on -one goals every single game. Those are the hardest ones to come by. And you think of a guy like that as more of a finisher. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up as a uh, former guy that you coached. Yeah, no, I, I think when when they were playing really good offense, the ball was spinning and swinging, you know, because it's really hard in that league to score against the really good cover defensemen. It is. And if your space – so if you're – and again, if your spacing's not great and you're not like a guy off the end line who's breaking ankles, you need the ball movement – to, to help lengthen the approach for the really good cover guy and give you an opportunity. Like when they weren't playing good offense, you know, him and Cav and, and Ryder were, you know, five and six step moving and jabbing and trying to, and there was no space. Yeah. And they, they, the approach was too short for the defenseman. When they, when those, both of those guys scored one-on-one, -on -one, it was mostly because what the other four or five defender offensive guys were doing spatially, and, and not gluing up and, and moving the ball quickly. Yep. Now you're starting your dodge a couple of yards from GLE or a couple of yards from the hash, and the defenseman, instead of a three-yard approach, has a seven-yard approach. Yep. That's what everybody needs, and I agree. When they, were, when they had that, they were really good one-on-one -on -one dodges. When they didn't have it, they were, they were gluing up and rocker and faking and trying to come walk the dog and – yeah, and the face wasn't. They there. might not have anything. And the cover and the and the cover defenseman and that, if the if the if there's a condensed offense with a really good cover guy and a guy who's not a you know burner off of a dot and doesn't have that long approach, yeah, that that's when the offense struggled. Switching gears, um, about one year ago, you know, next month, it's middle of September, I took a trip to Boston. I was on a little lacrosse tour, and. Um, my, uh, my buddy, Mark Blake, his, his son, uh, Graham, plays for you. And he had front row tickets to the Who on Friday night, September 13th. And then um, Saturday night, you and I got a chance to go to uh, watch Billy Joel, you know, back from your old hood um, <laughs> um, at Fenway. And um, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, we just, it's not a great podcast with us if we're not talking a little bit about music. Um, the, the pandemic has just ruined these opportunities. Me and Mark and our, our, uh, our crew with Brad Bowman and Shawnee Allen call ourselves the Wolf Pack, and we go to concerts all over the world. And those are on hold right now, sadly, and so is, uh, so is your concert going. But, um, man, well, that was a good time, wasn't it? Uh, it was a great time. And, you know, I think, you know, what people don't know about Jamie, besides being, a, you know, a, a great friend and, you know, a cross connoisseur, you know, taking his family all over the country on these trips for music and lacrosse is, you know, it's, you know, pretty cool. And getting to do it now um, with your family is, is pretty cool when we're all spread out. And so, yeah, it was great when Jamie came to visit because we were surviving just our first September 1st. And so we were yeah. all over the place with recruiting and, and starting a new, you know, starting our, you know, our time on the field with our players at Harvard. So yeah, that was a great, you know, break. Uh, for for Jamie and I and you know Billy Joel is from Hicksville, Long Island. Shout out Li out there. Li. And uh, and you know where did he go to high school? Where did Billy went, Joel go to high school? I think he went to Hicksville High School. So he grew, he actually grew up right behind. So with like Ronnie Caputo. I, you're gonna have to ask Ronnie that. You know, Ron, Ronnie might have been you know holding. Ronnie's a little younger, I think. Ronnie Ronnie, Ronnie might have had his jeans jacket you know in his closet. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, he grew up right behind the Holy Trinity High School, which is right on the border of Levittown and Hicksville. And so, yeah, no, that was really cool. I, I, um, I, you know, the following December after I went to Billy Joel with you, I took my wife to the Madison Square Garden show and so oh, yeah. took, my, took my daughter Rory and um, one of my nephews. And so, yeah, that was really cool. And, was. People and shout out to them. Jenks. Shout out to Jenks, Dave Jenkins, That's for really hooking Jenks. us up with the tickets. Really, my fellow. Boston Cannon teammate got us tickets and so 
the um but you know jamie videos the songs that he likes so jamie's probably got a thousand songs so you can at least go back not just in your mind i have to iphone to recapture really good songs or really good moments so jamie you know when you know jamie when you you pass on you might want to you know pass your music your your iphone music collection to some I, music Luciano, I, think. I think I put them all in my blog. 2019 was an unbelievable year with Elton John, Eric Church, Rolling Stones, The Who, and Billy Joel. Unbelievable lineup. And Neil Young. Didn't you go to Neil Young, too? No, not that year. It was a couple years okay. back. So, so yeah. no, listen, you know, I think, I think, you know, I think people have kind of reconnected to a lot of the things from their past that – you know, brings them joy. Like, you know, when you get to our age, we all get nostalgic. Yeah. You know, young kids are always rolling their eyes and loud. We haven't listened to that song yet. But you are trying to reconnect to something that, that brings you joy. And the fact that you can't go to concerts, you do the next best thing. You listen, you know, you pull it up on YouTube or Spotify or, you know, find a concert. And I watch a lot of concerts on YouTube. Like I, I'll think of a band and I'm like, I want to, I'm in that mood. And, and yeah, the, the commercials pop up and everything, but it does connect you to a moment and uh, friends and, you know, music that you liked at a certain time and maybe still do. So yeah, that was, a, that was a great time. Jamie and I got a lot of lacrosse in. We, we did a podcast in my office. Yeah. I think we, I think we uh, might've worked out. We went to the show. We caught an Uber together. We in the rain. We talked about lacrosse then after the, after that game. So yeah, that was a great day. That was. Um, so, by the way, did you watch those music movies that I told you about? My, my but Mark, Mark told me about it. Muscle Shoals. Have you seen yes, that? I watched, Muscle, I watched Muscle Shoals. You know, and we, watched, when we were brothers or whatever, that movie about the band? Yes, I watched, you know, and I, I read Levon Helm's biography. I've read Robbie Robertson's book. I've watched The Last Waltz 20 times. And so, yeah, it, yeah the, 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 like one of the things that I've kind of tried to, you know, I think, I think an epiphany that I've had in my own personal life, you know, during the pandemic is that you got to be open to a different point of view, whether it's politically or, or culturally or with people, you know, whether it's letting go of, you know, arguments that you have with people or, but something simple like to, to connect that was, you know, the general perception about the band was that Robbie Robertson selfishly wanted to you know do soundtrack movies and get into movies and he wanted to do what he wanted to do and he decided that he didn't want to do the band anymore so that's the mythology and then so when you watch that doesn't really come out in the band but it comes out in the books that you read yeah you read any of these blogs about it and then you watch when we were brothers and it's like these guys were total drug addicts and I wasn't really into that thing. And I had a family and I had a wife and a kid and, you know, I just didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah. So, so like being open to different interpretations of not like fake news or stuff, that stuff, but more like that there's, yeah, there's different ways of looking at stories. Yeah. Kind of like V hold and cross check hold. I like V hold and cross check hold. <laughs> you know, like, well, we talked about that with Landis. We talked about that, that, that Landis, you know, I let Landis cross check hold more, mostly because he could. He didn't have to. He was a freak athlete, so he could he could drive guys longer with the butt end than than before he had to V hold guys. All right, last topic. Let's talk a little bit about recruiting in this pandemic. It's been a weird summer, uh, not being able to watch guys play live. Um, how has film? you know, giving you a different perspective on recruiting and, and, and what's it going to look like, do you think, for you guys or for the general population as it relates to this um, this September 1st coming right up? Well, I mean, I think the the, the club guys and, and their technology partners have done a really good job, you know. Other than a few starts where you had, you know, guys with funky uniforms that it was, you know, their numbers were, you know, like Stonehenge from, you know, <laughs> Like the numbers were like, I thought you said, I thought you said 12 inches, you know, it should, the numbers should be this big, you know? Yeah, yeah. So after we got through that glitch, the rosters were better. You know, you were able to create a library. My assistants, you know, coach Hutchinson and, and coach uh, Corrigan have done a great job of watching, you know, 
hundreds of hours of, of games and then giving me the suggestions of things that I needed to watch. And so, you know, I think, I think the club guys did a really good job. I think the, 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 the videoing was done really well. So I think they, they work really hard to make it easy for us. Um, I think the hardest thing, to be honest with you, was watching the MLL and PLL and then going to watch a club game. Yeah. Yeah, it was like underwater lacrosse, you know, you're like, holy moly. So that's why, June, to, that's why June lacrosse always looks like crap after championship weekend. You're coaching yeah. you guys all spring and all of a sudden you're watching like, you know, a 17 year old. Exactly. So fast. Yeah. So, and the same things that were the, the problem in the PLL spacing over dodging, you know, bad defense are still true in the summer. So that's always been a hard thing. It's been, you know, figuring out defensively what I like and what mistakes are a guy is a guy making that I can live with and coach out of him, and which things are just endemic to his game. So that becomes harder watching on film. The, um, you know, so, you know, yeah, it's not it's not been easy, and and you you try not to make mistakes. You know, you can't do for the twenty twos. You're not you can't do any sort of investigation beyond cursory conversations. So you really don't know about character and, you know, besides skill. So I think there's going to be a lot more mistakes potentially made by people because yeah. of the pandemic. And, um, you know, some, some teams, because of the larger rosters and all these transfers and seniors coming back on a lot of teams, I think, I think, I think recruiting, I think some of these teams are going to be massive for the next couple of years. And, and I think even more, if you, if you, if you have, transfers and seniors coming back or upperclassmen coming back to do their extra their extra years that the NCAA is going to give them combined with you know having to recruit this summer on by just exclusively watching film I think some teams are going to adapt by having even bigger recruiting classes so you're going to see teams with 55 60 players on their team not in the Ivy League but in the non-Ivy Leagues um, and again not I'm not it's not a pejorative. I just think that's no, nature. I think facts. I think facts. I mean, teams are just going to do that. And so um, at a time where expenses and budgets are under attack, so you have bigger team and less money to spend on them and probably less flights and more regional games. And can you bring two buses for a team when you're trying to cut, if you have 60 players on your team and your budget's getting shrunk, so that means less team, you know, probably more of an Ivy League model of, of who's traveling with, you know, 30 people, you know, 32 people. And so I think the Ivy League model is, is potentially a pathway for lacrosse going down the road, but that's going to be a tough transition for the non-Ivy budgets yeah. and the non-Ivy, you know, philosophy around recruiting and things like that. So, um, yeah, we're, we're getting ready for September 1st and emails and texts and phone calls and, and all of that. And we're, you know, we're really excited. I think there's a lot of momentum and excitement about a program, and I think a lot of credit to our, you know, Coach Bergman, Coach Kyle, Coach uh, Corrigan, Coach Hutchinson. Um, you know, we're, I think we're really prepared, and I think there's a lot of interest in where Harvard can get to. Have you found watching so much film that you're watching, you've got to be watching more film of players than you would have otherwise watched, fair? Yes. And you didn't get to watch them play live, and w what is it that you can't see from your perspective on film that you can see live and vice versa? You know, I think you're, I think I'm watching cause I'm not wanting, you know, yeah. Cause coach Hutchinson's my, you know, you know, kind of recruiting coordinator. And so he's kind of watching everything and filtering and straining stuff for me to watch. So when I'm watching, I can watch closer. So I'm probably watching more because I, you can rewind. Like when you're sitting on that chair on the sideline and it's 114, degrees and you've got a pile of waters and a bagel wrapper at your feet and you're surrounded by other coaches, you're distracted and things like that. Well, when it's just you and the screen, you're really paying attention. So I think I'm picking up a lot more detail than I would typically pick up when I was watching on the sidelines. So I'm not watching as much as I would when I was an assistant coach or as if I was on the road recruiting as a head coach. Now, I think I'm watching the games I'm watching because he's kind of curating that for me. He's like, watch this game against that guy or against that team. And so I'm, I'm kind of pretty dialed in. So I'm not watching as much, but I'm watching closer and deeper. Right. Well, I mean, that's the advantage of film. I mean, you know, if you 
anybody asks you after a game that you coached, what did you think? It's kind of hard to give an answer other than, well, I'll let you know after I watch the film. Because whatever you thought was good wasn't that good. Whatever you thought was bad wasn't that bad. It's the same thing in recruiting. Um, you can get wowed by people in person. But then you can go back and watch the film and be like, eh, you know, it was pretty good. But there was, uh, there's not, it's not that good. Um, but I do think it's hard to see explosiveness um, burst quite as well. It's like you said, because you're just used to watching other athletes on TV, even, even if it's NFL athletes. It's like you're just used to watching Sports Center. Yeah. And so, but when you get on a field, you're like, man, that kid, that kid's got some pop, you know, and it's a little, a little bit harder to see that. Yeah. No, I think the, you know, you try not to judge too harshly, you know, you don't want to be dismissive. Although there's comfort in saying, you know, <laughs> he's not good enough. Thumb down, thumb down. You're like Maximus, you know, you're like this. And so the, um, so yeah, you want to not be too dismissive. Um, and you also, like I said, you know, which things are fixable, which things are endemic to his game, having the kind of limited by the kinds of com the conversations we can have. So we don't know some of that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, they're this, if the spacing on some of the PLL possessions were bad, watching some of these club games, once you rip your retinas out, you know, it's like, <laughs> so, so, so as a Dodger, you're like, you know, that guy probably could have ran by that guy, but the adjacent guys yeah. were killing his space. So, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll get highlight videos from guys and be like, coach, I shut down this guy. And you're like, you watch the video and you're like, you actually, you were about six or seven times or one step about get away from getting racked when the adjacent guy sloughed down the hash and took away that space. That's not really you dominating like that. Yeah, you know, you know so, it would just add a two-point line to club lacrosse. I think, you know, you, you'd see better spacing. Those adjacent yeah. guys would be stepping in for their twos, man, and people would have to get out on them. I think if more guys hired you to help them run this two-man stuff because it's, it's spawned so much bad that it's almost like, you know, Coach Will Corrigan, you know, you know how much respect I have from you. When it's done well, it's crazy hard to coach against. But you know there's a lot of bad out there, and it's – and it's crushing the ability to, to evaluate some of these guys because the defensemen are killing space. Guys aren't getting out of the way. They're not setting good picks. They're not popping. They're not, they're over carrying. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think for, for some guys, the, the bad spacing makes the defenseman look better and an offensive guy look worse. How much can you tell or not uh, a defenseman's ability to communicate when you can't hear him. Uh, you know, listen, that's why the Simon Says drill is so key. Like, if you can't be loud, you can't play. You got to practice it like every, any other skill, you know. Um, but on film, sometimes, you, what's that? You, on film, there may not be audio, right? No. No. I, 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 was, I was telling some of the kids that I work with in my uh, Jam3 athlete program, like, to mic up. Be Eddie Glazner. Let's see how it goes. Let's see what happens. Maybe you don't have to share it with everybody. But if you mic'd yourself up during a game, it would be pretty darn interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, yeah, no, there's, 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 you know, the, 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 like the club coaches, I think, have a good motivation, some better than others to coach and do practices and things like that. But, you know, they, they don't, they're running a club for a living. I, I don't necessarily would consider them X's and O's coaches for a living. And so, and then you throw the pandemic into it and then, you know, all the customer service work that they had to do to salvage the summer and events and things like that. And so, yeah, not surprisingly, the, the little cross hasn't been great. I want to, I, I want to create a little public service message from you. If you could tell a club organization what offense to run based on what would allow you to get a really good look at a defender or a defense, what would it be? Or what wouldn't it be? Um, you know, it's probably like some sort of 10 set, some sort of umbrella set, because you can, you can, there, there's, you're, you're, you can be wide and high. You can open up the inside for a lot of stuff. You can easily teach your attack different kind of actions. You can dodge from, you know, the, the low wing, the corner and the alley, top center, 
and you can do two man stuff out of it where you're popping people from the inside and vacating space. I think it's com it's not complex like Sanskrit, yeah. but as I as I tell Steve Govett every time he's every time he's talking about Canadian offense, I text him. I'm like, yo man, it's not Sanskrit. You can you can you know the Americans can figure it out. <laughs> so you don't want to make it Sanskrit, but you do want to create space and create speed and create reads for the offense. Because if there's reads for the offense, then there's reads for the defense. So probably a 10 set. And the 10 set, you know, by nature is, is high wing dodges that can also turn into low wing dodges. And I agree because wings just give you so many more options and more space when it's alley, 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 you know, what ends up happening, it's like an easy early slide. It kills the play. The, the, the ball carrier is like at the hashes in like 12 yards. He's got nowhere to go with the ball. He runs away, you know, it takes forever. You know, when you dodge those wings and you kick it, you know, you can get it moving. You can swing it across the top two passes, extend that defense a little bit like we were talking earlier in the show where, you yeah. know, the ball movement will spread people out and give you some, give you some looks. But, you know, I, but I don't, I, you know, the, you, you're not seeing a lot of attack action, you know, you, you see, Maybe there's a clear through on the dodge side. I know. That's the worst is when there's no clear through. It's like if you don't clear through for somebody, you are literally killing the coach's opportunity to see everything, anything. There's, you're not going to see anything. You're not going to see on-ball defense. You're not going to see off-ball offense. You're not going to see dodging. I mean, it's, it's brutal. That's why those one, three, twos, honestly, the two out top, one crease, you know, um, wing X wing setup uh, is kind of – it's not a bad set. It's a good offense and all, but but it's it's kind of brutal because as soon as a lefty doesn't get through, it's over, right? And everyone's yeah. like in the way, and then the X guy comes all the way over because they're like trying to be in, they're over overplaying their outlet. The next thing you know, his man's in the way, and and you just can't yeah. see on ball defense because no one's yeah. getting out of the way. Yeah. So, and I just don't think the they're not teaching. I mean, you should have. It's not that hard to have three different attack actions. You know, based on. At least, at least two, you know, like clear yeah. through fade, right? I mean, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, clear through fade. You know, what do you, you know? Can you can you pop out your crease guy to the back side and, and fill with another uh, one of the perimeter minis? So, you know, so I, I just you know, so as a result, I think the offense has have, has been worse this summer from the summer events, which makes defend makes defensemen look better or harder to evaluate. And if you're an off ball offensive guy. You're not getting your end of play opportunities as a dodger or a scorer. So it's right. yeah, it's a yeah, exactly. Way. So how are you going to read the guy who's like an unbelievable off ball guy? And so as a result, when you get these highlight videos, it's a bunch of a lot of unbelievable plays, and you don't you don't see a lot of unbelievable plays at the at a college level. If you have to rely on unbelievable plays, you're going to lose a lot. So, what do you think about this idea? of doing a breakdown. I do this for a lot of the athletes I work with. I'll break down a tournament for them um, into like all of their touches and I will watch that. But I was thinking like, like if I were a coach, I don't want to see just the unbelievable plays. Although, you know, it's fine to look at a highlight video and get, you know, see if you're interested or not, but, but to be able to have somebody break it down for you so that you can actually just look at, you know, all of your on-ball opportunities on defense, all of your touches on offense. Um, that would be. I, I've, done, I've done this with defensemen. I've asked them, don't send me a highlight. Send me all the six-on-six -six possessions from your game against yeah. so and so. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have, you know, coach, uh, you know, my coaching staff right now ripping apart, um, you know, we're, there's a bunch of really good goalies in the 22 class. I'm like, I want to see the low lights. I want to see the goals they gave up. Because is it a technique thing? Was it, hey, that was a layup, you know, was he on the ball and the guy just made a really good placement? Like, you know, we evaluated their highlights and the games that they played in. So I want to see the goals that they gave up. Be, you know, was the guy guessing or was it just, yeah. he had no chance. Okay. But he made a good move on the ball. Like right. He was patient and quiet, you know. So, yeah, we're doing a low lights right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, so honestly, if you're a goalie, you know, people have said, well, should I send goals that went in? And your general answer would be like, of course not. But at the, at the end of the day, you can evaluate a lot from what, whether the goalie was, you know, pa patient and moving in the right direction and just a little bit late because the nature of the position is it's going to happen. Right. But, you know, if you're, if you're completely going the wrong direction all the time, 
you know, particularly the guy that's making the miraculous low save all the time, but then is just dropping every time before shooters even. Right. He's, his hand, he's, he's, his highlights full of those low opposite angle saves because yeah, he's, yeah. he's cheating and dipping, you know, and you're never seeing, like, like I, well, we brought this up with a kid recently, and I'm like, I don't see any stick side high saves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he's dipping and Although, cheating, yeah. you know. And maybe that's where he's getting – that's where he's giving up his goals, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, so, the guys that are pretty quick, you know, that is where you're probably going to get them. I mean, remember the 1998 gold medal game, USA-Canada, where the Canadians came back from, like, down, you know, 12-5 or something like that, and Sal's in the net, and every single goal went stick side high because they were shooting leaners like crazy, and Sal was so quick. And he was great stick side high. I mean, listen, he's arguably the best goalie ever, but – it's, it's not necessarily an indictment when it goes in, but if the point is we need, you know, if you're going to evaluate somebody, you really want to see more than just the highlights and more than just the saves for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm a big fan of looking at failures. I think they're, they're, they give you a peek into the soul. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Jerry, um, so great talking lacrosse with you, talking music, talking movies, talking dogs talking recruiting, talking V-holds. I mean, you know, it's just the whole gamut. It was awesome, man. And uh, thank you. And it's always fun. I look forward to when we're at a concert together again or sitting in the office, you know, face-to-face and uh, be well and give my best to your family. You got great, you know, you got a great crew. It's always Thanks, great. Man. You too. Tell your, uh, tell your whole crew, family, and assistants I say what's up. And um, I'll probably be in Boston sometime this fall. We'll see you then. Awesome, Jamie. Take care. All right, take care, man.